Psalm 15 said that this is a psalm of David. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. Who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. Amen? <laughs> it's almost like a sermon and a sermon in a sermon because there are so many things in there. But let's pray and ask God today to just maybe take part of that, a piece of it today, and really have it dug down deep into our soul today. Because I think some of these things are difficult to talk about, and yet they're very real, and we experience them often in our lives. So let's just ask God to use His Word today, parts of His Word even to explain His Word. Put together a message just to do that. So, so Lord, I thank you. Father, for those that are here this morning, nothing happens by chance. Nothing occurs, Father, without of your sight. Nothing happens, Lord, that is not within your sight and maybe in your will. And Father, we just ask this morning that as we study these five verses, these short, this short psalm this morning, that, Lord, there would be a tremendous amount of understanding and praise and grace and truth and all that we need today, Father, to put this all together in our lives. Thank you, Father, for all that are here today, this morning, for those that are watching uh, on, on YouTube, those who cannot be here. We just ask, Father, that you'd bless in a special way. We give ourselves to you this morning. In Jesus' name, And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. So, like I said, this is a very short psalm, but it's one that is so full. I'm, I'm going to take my watch off so that I don't do what Joe usually accuses me of, and that's preach too long. So I'm going, it's 25 minutes to 11, all right? When we get to like 10 after 11, you can stand up or scream at me and wave something at me or whatever and say, what is that? Is that a ball you're going to throw at me? I don't, (laughs) okay. Whoa, (laughs) okay. We need some history. You know, these these verses are, are written by David. And that fan is literally, can you turn that fan? It's literally pulling my stuff all over the place. I can't keep my book open. Oh, thanks so much. We need to, to keep history in perspective. We have to have a historical perspective today as we look back at when David wrote this, what part of the world he was writing from, and what was happening in the world where he was living. This psalm was written about 1,000 years B.C. So you figure that out from 2020, over 3,000 years ago. And isn't it amazing that God's word can be written that long ago and address a situation maybe that was happening at a particular time, but then as as we travel through time, 3,000 years later, it's just as pertinent today as it it was when David wrote it. And that's the beauty of God's word. We're We're in a time here where David is living under what we would call the Mosaic Law. In other words, the Mosaic Law, if you tried to put it in a library, would probably after so many years, would literally fill that library because there were so many things that were added to it after Moses wrote it. And it became, it was becoming, and still was, even in the New Testament when Paul was writing about it, the law was becoming something that was becoming a burden, was becoming something that became a a millstone around people's neck because you realize from the law, what was the purpose of the law? The purpose of the law was to reveal sin. It was not to provide, in a sense, it was not a list of rules and regulations to live by, by which we are saved. If that was the case, you and I have absolutely no hope. None. None whatsoever. Just take the Ten Commandments by themselves. doesn't matter. Then add all the rest of the list of things that had, by the time Jesus came, was an absolute burden on the people. So even during David's time, a thousand years before Christ, there was still this, this, this burdensome part of the law that seemed so unbearable 
and so unable to adhere to without failure. And yet, if you look at what was going on during the Mosaic system, Paul says that the Abrahamic covenant, way back in Genesis chapter 12 and chapter 15, was a covenant that was made with Abraham that was an everlasting covenant. And Paul says it's still in effect. So by the time thousands of years later, you get to the New Testament and you get to 2020, that Abrahamic covenant is still in effect. And what happened, the famous verse that we know so well, Abraham believed God, and what? It was reckoned to him as righteousness. In other words, God, in a sense, gave him the ability to believe, and therefore, in his faith, God says, because of that, I will bless you, not just in your life, but the millions and millions that come after you will be blessed because of you. But Paul says, alongside of that, 400 and some years later, you have the Moses law that was laid down. And this is what David is under right now. <laughs> and so that perspective is important. We have to deal with the fact that in order to have the kind of results that we want in the Christian life, which if I asked you what those were, you would say love, joy, peace, patience, self-control, all these things that make life better. The giving, the understanding, the loving, all the things that come with the Christian life are because of and should stem from the same kind of faith that Abraham exercised thousands of years ago. Looking forward to someone who would give us the ability <clears throat> to believe, the ability to, to believe something that would absolutely guarantee where we were going. And of course, we all know who that was, that some thousands of years later, after Abraham, Jesus came. Out of the bloodline of David, he came. And the gospel is so clear that anybody who believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So in a, in a sense, God has taken all of this massive, amounts of regulations, rules, uh, things that we have to do in order to have a right relationship with him. He has taken it all down and boiled it into one person, and that is Jesus. David was looking forward to that. He didn't know him at this time, this thousand years before he came. And so what he is about to say here is just two things. I want to share two main points this morning out of this, out of this psalm. There's a big question that everybody asks, and I think David was one who did as well. He said, who gets to enjoy the presence of God? <laughs> What's verse 1 say? Again, we could spend a whole lot of time on verse 1. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He had a way in the Psalms of asking the same question in two different ways. He's asking the same question here. But he's saying it in different ways. Who can sojourn in your tent? Literally, who can sojourn in your tabernacle? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? Now, in David's time, there was no temple, right? You know the history. Who got to build the temple? It wasn't David. Why didn't David get to build the temple? Because God said, your hands are bloody. You're a violent person. And because of that, it will be your son who gets to build the temple. And who was that? Solomon, right? So he had, as Moses had begun, he had the tabernacle that was, that had, was a great picture of the presence of God. But he was a priest. David was a king. He was not a priest. A priest was the one who went into the tabernacle, into the Holy of Holies, into, to offer offerings for the sin of the nation. David couldn't even do that because he was not a priest. And so he says, who, O Lord, shall sojourn, shall visit, shall find hospitality, is literally what it means. Who will find hospitality in your tabernacle, in your tent? Who will dwell on your holy hill? Who gets to do that? Now we think about David. When you think about David, what do you think? You think of, a, of the verse, the famous verse about David. What does it say? He was a man after God's own heart, right? But he was also a man 
who had the husband of a woman killed or allowed to be killed so that he could have her. And so his life was not always the amazing King David who never, ever, ever broke the law of God. And yet God still called him and is mentioned so many times in Scripture the importance of King David, right? So who, if he can't, (laughs) if he can't enjoy the presence of God, then who in the world can? That is, you know, questions are something, you can make a statement and people maybe won't react. But if you ask somebody a question, you know, how are you today? What happens in that person's mind? They begin to think, how am I going to respond? If you ask them, how can I enjoy the presence of God? In their mind, they're going to think for your question. Because it engages the mind. It makes the mind work. And questions are a are, are tool, are tools that can be used like they were by Jesus himself and here by David to inspire an engagement in your mind that makes you and me think. And questions always demand an answer, right? So he's, the question is here, who can sojourn? Hospitality is one of those things when they... But his picture is when you go inside of that tent, you find comfort, you find rest, you find someone who is is, um, tending to your needs, you find someone who wants to fellowship with you. And you think about that kind of hospitality inside of the very tent where God dwells. That's one thing. That's a, that's, I don't like to use magical, but it's sometimes a mystical thing that we can't quite grab onto. You and I have never been In the Holy of Holies, we've never experienced that thing that the high priest would would get to do when he went in there, right? So that presence of God was very welcoming. And so you, you bring that down into today's world, into your own life, into my life. How do we practice this kind of hospitality? How do we make people feel comfortable to be with us, either in our home, in our churches, driving in the car, wherever it is you're trying to have fellowship with someone. That is, a, that is a privilege that we have to find in each other's company some sort of peace, some sort of answers to questions, some sort of, of prayer time where they can pray for us, some type of, of ministry and fellowship that we can come away from being extremely glad that we went there. Right? So he's saying, who can enjoy the presence of God? Well, everybody can. But he's asking this question in two different ways. He uses the word sojourn. He uses the word tabernacle. He uses the word, <coughs> excuse me, dwell in, who can dwell in your holy hill. There's a, there's a Christian responsibility that kind of comes just as a side note from this very first verse, is how do we practice that particular part of the Christian life? And that is hospitality. And that's not just inviting somebody over for dinner. That can be a that can be a tool, that can be something that we can use, but hospitality is something that in our culture used to be, and I hope in many places still is, but it used to be a very important part of keeping our culture together, of, exi- of families existing together in a particular place to withstand things that come at them in the world. And there are lots of them. And you think about... Basically what David was saying, knowing that he couldn't go, if, if he's talking about the, the tabernacle, he knows he can't go in, he knows he can't minister in there, but he desperately wants some sort of presence and relationship with God. Do we, do we all have that? Do we have that, that ultimate strong desire to be with him? And I'm not talking about when we die, that's going to be nice. But right now, is that our desire? We don't have a temple, we don't have a tabernacle to go to anymore. We have the presence of God. Wherever Christians are, God is there. Wherever anyone is, God is there. There is an absolute perfection in his inhabitants of this world. It's available to everybody. David was asking, he says, I just want, I want, my desire is to be 
in the presence of God. I want to walk in fellowship with him. I want to be in step with him as a person, as, as my God. I want to be in step with him. I don't want to be out of step. We all know what it means to be out of step. Anybody ever march in a marching band in high school? <clears throat> awesome thing to watch. Because when they're working and when it's working together, everybody is in step. It's a beautiful thing to watch. One person gets out of step and all eyes go on to that person, right? And so it's, there's something about our relationship with him where he wants us to be as often as we possibly can, understanding who we are and that we're human. He wants us to be in step with him. <clears throat> he wants us to be in fellowship with him. If you want to learn about the fellowship that we're supposed to have with God, just read the book of 1 John. It's one of the most simple books ever written in the New Testament. It's easy to read. Constantly talks about our fellowship with God and how that affects our life. So that's the first question. How do I, how do I enjoy the presence of God? The second question is probably a little bit more difficult. And it says this. In, ver in the following verses, that was just verse 1. In 2 through 5, we see some really interesting things. And so that question is, how does the presence of God then change someone's behavior? <laughs> how does the presence of God change a person's behavior? Char the title of this message is, Does Character Matter? <laughs> and believe me, character David understood in verse 2 when he says, and David is coming from a man who in his heart has believed and knows God personally, right? We would all agree with that. He knows him. And he says, who is the one then that can enjoy that presence of God? Verse 2 says this, he who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. So just like Abraham David had that same faith, and just like David and us, our conduct in life reflects, 100% reflects our relationship with him and our love for him. So now David gives us some examples, and these examples are not exactly all-inclusive. You could add some more to this list that he gives here, many of them negative, you could add to those, when you look in the New Testament or other verses, you can find other things to add to this list. So this isn't an inclusive list, but it is one that probably is the, is the best concise list that he could give in what it means in the presence of God or out of the presence of God. In fellowship with God or out of fellowship. Speaks truth in verse 2 speaks truth in his heart. Now truth, I mean shoot, even Pilate, they asked Pilate what is truth. He, he, people struggle with this question. If I asked you what is truth, and you say, well, truth is the opposite of a lie. <laughs> okay? Truth is something that never ever can be altered or changed. Right? Truth is truth. How we react to it there's a million in ways to react to the truth. But the truth, if the truth is something that is really solid and something that never changes, and even Jesus says, know the truth, and the truth shall what? Sets you free. <laughs> Lies never set us free. Lies hold us in bondage. Lies are like from Genesis when it says, sin crouches at the door waiting to have its moment, right? And that oftentimes comes through lies. And lies, the fruit of lies, are definitely not like the fruit of truth, obviously, right? So it's the, the speaking of truth is like the very center of our entire being. It's when it says our, in, in our heart. Now what does it mean when something's in your heart? Obviously that's just an organ that hopefully keeps pumping and, as long as you're alive, right? It's a very important organ. And yet it's a picture, right, of the very center of our being, the very center of our thinking processes, the, the things that we truly, truly believe and grab onto are things that are in our heart. Not just in our head, but we've, it's traveled down to become a total part of our soul. 
The Jews call it the kishka. I love, it's that center of the human being that is centered on what that person thrives on, what that person believes, what that person reacts to. And hopefully, if it's truth, <laughs> that affects everything we do. If it's not truth, that affects everything that we do or say. And we live in a world today where it's really difficult sometimes, and I don't think it's just today. David wrote this, like I say, 3,000 years ago. It's been a problem with humans ever since the fall. It's difficult oftentimes to sort through and find truth around you, other than if you truly know him and want to uh, do what he wants, you're going to look to what you believe, and what I believe is the word of God that came directly from, what does Paul say in Timothy? It is literally, scripture is God breathed. It literally comes out of the mouth of God, profitable for correction, reproof, training in righteousness, so that the man of God can be complete, right? So we, if we really trust that, if that is something that is part of your life and my life, then it's easy to say, this is where I put my trust, my faith, and where I find truth. But when you, you have to live out in the world, you have to see and listen to people, you have to listen to the news, you have to listen and read newspapers or talk to other people or read other books, <coughs> other philosophies, whatever they might be. It's hard oftentimes to find truth in all of that. What is it, Lord, that you want me to get from what I'm hearing? When I see what's going on around me, what am I supposed to do? How do I... How do I deal with what I know in my heart? If someone says something, I guarantee it with the Spirit in your life. When someone says something that is so absolutely wrong and against God's will, something in your heart goes, ugh, right? You know beyond a shadow of a doubt that what you've just heard is not true. But the enemy likes to make it a little less difficult to figure out what you're hearing is right or not by embellishing it, by adding something that maybe is partially true, and coming up with the end product that is so much of a lie, but it just catches us right off guard. It is so important, David says, to speak truth in our heart, not just in our mouth. In fact, Jesus says what? Out of the mouth comes all kinds of things. The heart is the very center of our being. Out of the abundance of our heart, Jesus says, the mouth speaks. Not out of our brain, not out of our mind, not out of our hands, not out of any other whoa parts of our body. A good catch, huh? But out of our heart, out of the very central part of our being. So, As we read on, things begin to get a little bit more difficult. <laughs> Who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. That verse alone you could talk about for hours. One commentator said this. He says, I think more damage, this is him speaking, I think more damage has been done to the church and its work by gossip, criticism, and slander than by any other single sin. So I say, don't do it. <laughs> Bite your tongue before you criticize anyone, especially someone of the household of faith. So, these words are difficult. He who slanders with his tongue does evil to his neighbor and takes up reproach against his friend. Backbiting is a word that, that, that's not the nicest word. Backbiting means to speak about someone behind his or her back rather than to his face. In other words, when their back is turned is literally what it means. And here's what James says. If, you've ever, if you ever want a real study on the tongue, go to the book of James. Because here's what he says in, verse, in chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. So also the tongue is a small member yet boasts of great things. How great a forest is blazed by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members 
staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Whew! Now that's a message just in itself. And does, does no evil to his neighbor. What are the two great commandments? When you think about Jesus, he was, I mean, amazing. If you just study the words of Jesus in the Gospels, those alone will keep you going for so long. When he, was, when he said the law and the prophets are boiled down to these two things, what are they? Love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. The second is just like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So who, who's my neighbor? We have, everybody has neighbors, right? The American English version of a neighbor is someone who lives, right? <clears throat> but that is not, that is not who your neighbor is. Your neighbor is anyone that you come in contact with in your life. You're not going to come in contact with all the billions of people that live on this planet, right? You're going to come in contact with a few of those. Some more than others, but you're going to come in contact with people. You're going to come in contact with people who you don't even know, who have a particular need, or who, uh, who just have the, the need to talk to somebody. That person then immediately becomes your neighbor. And that's what it says. <clears throat> if you can boil all that library down into those two things, to love God and to love neighbors, you've, you've taken care of a whole lot of issues that are going to come up in your life. Luke chapter 10 talks about the Jesus telling the story of the Good Samaritan. You know that story? The guy who was robbed and beaten almost to death and left in a ditch to die. And three people come along. The first one is a priest. Comes along and walks on the other side of the road so he doesn't get too close to this person and goes on his way. The second one is a Levite who does the same thing, who walks by and does nothing. And a Samaritan walks by. A Samaritan of all people, right? In the culture of the Jews, Samaritans were not exactly on the high priority list of their favorite people. A Samaritan goes by and not only helps him and aids and, and helps his wounds and all the rest of it, but what does he do? He takes him to a, a hotel and gives the guy money and says, here, take care of this guy. He needs some help. That, my friend, is one who does no evil to his neighbor. What about the reproach? Nor takes up a reproach against his friend. <laughs> what does Proverbs 17, 17 say? It's one that we've heard many times. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. That's the part that always bugged me. I wasn't quite sure what that meant. A friend loves at all times. That's pretty easy to understand. But he is also a brother who was born for adversity. And what is adversity? Adversity are trials and tribulations, or things that happen in life that are so complicated and hurtful and bring us down. So a friend, then, is born. In other words, he is going to be able to help that friend, that person, when that person is going through tough times. That's when you discover your friends. The true friend not only just loves you, but a true friend also holds your hand and carries you through in a time that's really, really, really troublesome. Adversity comes to everybody. Everybody. So in verses 4 and 5, this, these are the last two verses. It says this, In whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. So in other words, my presence with the Lord should affect even 
how, ide- how I deal with people that I consider rather difficult. <laughs> how many of you have ever had to deal with someone that was difficult? That doesn't listen. It's easy to look at them and say, ah, oh, you know, they keep going like this and they're bound for hell. That's all there is to it. In our minds, sometimes we say, I don't want to deal with somebody like that. And yet, that part about in whose, or who swears to his own hurt and does not change. You know what that means? That's a kind of a, a weird phrase, but it's a really interesting phrase. It means this. <coughs> it says, it simply means that we keep our promises even when it is no longer to our advantage to do so. In other words, he's willing even in his own, in his own, even be hurt by the whole situation, but he's going to bring to conclusion what he knows he has to do. Because things, when you're dealing with difficult people, or when you're dealing with anybody, think about it, is it ever convenient? And most times it's not. What happens? Things interrupt our schedule. Things interrupt what we're doing. You're out doing your chores, you're at work, you're cleaning the house, you're, you're dealing with your kids, all the rest of it, and all of a sudden you get this phone call right in the middle of this, and, and your whole day changes because someone has an issue that has to be dealt with. So these happen all the time. They're never convenient. God, I think, on purpose wants them to be inconvenient. He wants us, if we truly are trying to seek the presence of God, and that's what it means to live in the presence, he's going to let us know Here's what it's going to Do you think David had ever had any interruptions in his life as king? Did he ever have times when he wished he could just be alone and have everybody leave him alone? Obviously, all the time. These Sometimes help and ministry is not. It is oftentimes the opposite. Hard times, bad times, they're never convenient. But look what he says about money. Everybody likes to talk about money, right? <laughs> money is a great thing. It's fun to have in your pocket. It is just a thing. But we're warned that the love of that money is what? The root of all evil. I think, wow, how can that possibly be? But he says, who does not put out his money, he's still talking about this guy who wants to be in the presence of God, right? How do I sojourn with God? He says, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. It says the same thing. Putting, a, putting money out at interest in the, at the wrong time, in other words, giving someone something and expecting not only the same back, but a whole lot of interest on top of it. That's called usury. You know, we don't use that word much. U-S-U-R-Y. Usury is the almost, I guess you could word, almost the sinful way to get and extort money out of people by supposedly giving them money. We have a responsibility of how to handle the money that God gives to us. It's usury is always, this sort of taking advantage of people is always an unfair advantage, and it's, it's taking advantage of someone else's misfortunes. And that's, that's sad. It's a form of greed that never should eclipse, ju- eclipse justice or mercy, or even Christian benevolence. Benevolence is something, it's just a big word. If we're benevolent, that means we're giving. Do with what God gives us. How do we use it? How do we how do we use that thing, that, that piece of paper that doesn't really have any life to it whatsoever, doesn't have any feelings, doesn't have any cares? It's what we do with it that oftentimes brings a whole lot of joy or it brings a whole lot of problems and trials. And money can even, unfortunately, can even draw, draw us away from God can actually change our heart. And when that heart becomes filled with something that it should not be filled with, 
often the results, as we see, are not good. So just remember, what's stemming from this is David talking about what does it mean to be in the presence of God all the time? It means some good, positive things to walk blamelessly before him, but it also means to take care of some of the human nature negative things that pop up in our lives. We've all experienced it. I've been selfish in my life here and there. I've had to learn from God's help what it really means to give, what it really means to help, what it really means to do that sort of ministry with money. And a lot of us go through that. I don't know if it's a man thing, but I I bet it affects everybody. It's one of those things we have to deal with. Money is to be used, is to be given away, is to be applied for help. It should be used to help each other, not to have power over each other. And so he's saying, who does not put out his money. I love the way this ESV reads because it, it's so convicting. Again. He does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things, and he ends on a very positive note, he who does these things shall never be moved and shall never be shaken, shall never be forced off of the right path. They'll never be weak. They will never be changed. They will never be altered in doing good. He who does these things, he or she who does these things, will never be moved. First John says, it's always good to go back to First John, when he says, very simply, and the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Whoever does the will of God abides forever. There have been multiple, multiple books written on how to find the will of God for your life. But I think in your heart, when your heart is the motivator, you know exactly, and I know exactly what the will of God is. I'm just going to read these last verses again. We're just going to close with this because it's almost like you really don't need to add anything to these words. They, they speak so loudly to us. It says, Who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who lives and walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not chain, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. Now, you know, we deal, with, we deal with people a lot. We deal with our families. We deal with our kids. We deal with our friends. We deal with people we don't know. But there are times when, when we see paths that people are on that are not right. And so it's one thing to, to constantly, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? To constantly... What? <laughs> I'm good at that. But now you made me lose my train of thought. No. We are supposed to be so gracious and so understanding, and we're so, part of the fruit of the Spirit is to be, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, all these things. And yet there are times when either in my own life or in someone else's life where either you have had to come to me or I've had to go to you or you've had to go to someone else and actually confront them with something that you know is hurting them, right? And that is one of the most difficult and yet one of the most productive things that a Christian can do in his or her walk. It's one thing, you know, to, uh, the, this idea of confessing sins to one another. I never have fully understood that, but there's a confession that takes place when we talk to each other and realize that I need to confess that what I've done is wrong. And so what does Paul say there too? He says, if anybody is found in any kind of sin or transgression, we 
who love God, we who are spiritual, should restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. Restoring is the word that is used in the Greek that means simply mending a bone on a broken arm or a broken leg. That's what that restoration is. It's fixing a problem and making someone healthy. And we're to do it in a spirit of gentleness. So don't ever think when it says, like that quote that I read from that commentator, that more damage has been done to the church and, and its work by gossip, criticism, slander, or any other single sin. And so he's saying, don't do it. But when you find yourself in a situation where you have to confront that, confrontation among family members can be very difficult. And yet it's something that brings, it, it's the sign of a healthy a healthy church. So I'm not saying I don't have anything particular in mind. I just want to, I want to reiterate that for you so that when whatever happens this week, you may have an opportunity to help someone. You may have an opportunity to give to someone. You may have the opportunity to help restore and set a bone spiritually in a person's life. And we're to do it always with one of the most important fruit of the Spirit, and that's gentleness, kindness, meekness. That's what the Christian life's all about. So, does, does character matter? Does, does it matter? How we live, does it matter how we react to situations? Absolutely it does. Because by faith we have acknowledged who he is and we've accepted him in our life and we take with it all the joys and sorrows that come with that particular life. <laughs> the Psalms are not always a happy thing, but they're a meaningful thing. And look, it's quarter after 11. I'm so proud of myself. But So Joe and Christy, if you're watching... We miss you, and we're anxious for you to come back and hope that you're really, really, really enjoying yourself on your sabbatical. So, as we do every Sunday, and we do it on purpose, and we do it because we believe it's a command of God, we, have, we celebrate communion together, we participate together in the Lord's table. We've done it a little differently lately because of the you-know-what outside these walls. Our world is a different world, and hopefully... It is not becoming the new normal, but we'll go back to the way it was again. So for now, we serve a little bit different than we used to, but that's, that's okay. Communion is something that is a personal thing. It's for family members, really. It's for those who know and trust Jesus as their Savior. It's one, it's a, that's a prerequisite for enjoying the Lord's table and for partaking together. And we do it together. You can do it alone if you want to. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's, it's, it's great. And it's neat when we can do it together as a family of God. And so that you'll be served at your tables. If you have some prayer requests today that you want someone to pray for, there'll be someone here on my right and left to take care of that for you as well. Normally we have somebody in the back, but lately we don't do that. But, um, you know, change is not always bad. We just have to roll with it, right? But God is good, amen? And we can always trust that even though Everything outside may be, in that sense, like John says, passing away before our very eyes. But if we do what he wants us to do, we will abide in that forever. And I'm thankful for that. Jesus gave, gave his life so that his broken body and shed blood was something that we can participate in as a remembrance and that can prompt us to do and to get rid of sin and to take care of things in the future. And we do that on purpose this morning. So let's close in prayer. And then we will uh, also sing some songs together. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, that just a tiny, tiny little piece of your, of your God-breathed word we have dealt with this morning. Some of them difficult, some of them not. But Lord, we ask that you would motivate in such a way through your Holy Spirit into our hearts, Father, from our minds to our hearts, from our hands to our hearts, from our mouths. To our hearts that we might maybe be just a little bit different today and as we encounter things this week that we know we will help us to do them always according to what you would have us do according to your will thank you for your son it's in his name that we pray amen